Okay, so top 10 sins and struggles. Top 10 sins and struggles. This is lesson uh, number six in this uh, particular series. As you know, we're counting down the top 10 sins and struggles that people listed in the congregational surveys uh, given out several months ago. And so far we've discussed the results of these surveys and they are in descending order. Uh, laziness, anger, cursing, and gossiping, there was a little tie there. Pride, number seven. Number six, neglecting church. We talked about that last time. And in this lesson tonight, we're going to discuss one of the sins and struggles that tied for the number five spot, and that is coping with change. Coping with change. There were two things that, that, that were tied for fifth. I'm going to do the first one tonight, and I'm going to do the other one next week because there's too much material to just do in one in one session. So coping with change. So this particular um, topic uh, does not fall into the sins category, it falls into the struggles category, right? Because I mean, you know, laziness and anger, cursing, those, those are sins. But having difficulty coping with change, that, that's not a sin. But that is a struggle that individuals um, uh, have in many, uh, in many instances. Uh, the issue here is the power of changing circumstances to affect a person's faith and their Christian practice in a negative way or to affect your health or well-being in a negative way. You know, change, change is traumatic. Even good change is traumatic. Sometimes affects your health, sometimes affects your faith, sometimes affects both. So a couple of case studies, a couple of uh, examples of uh, difficulty in dealing with change. For example, your elderly mother is put into a nursing facility, leaving your dad alone at home. But you, one of the children, live 120 miles away from mom and dad. Now your younger married bro uh, unmarried brother, he lives in the same town as your parents. You get the, get the scenario I'm creating here? Can you see the problems that are going to arise with this change in living arrangements? Mom's in a nursing home, dad is you know, aged but is at home, and both of them are 120 miles away from you. Perhaps let's say you're the daughter. And your brother, he lives in the same town, but he's an unmarried guy, he's, got, he's busy. So some of the things that would come up with a scenario like this, with a change like this, perhaps the fair division of labor for the children. Maybe the unmarried brother you know, barely goes, but when the daughter drives 120 miles, she cleans the house, takes care of her dad, cooks a lot of meals ahead of time, goes and visits her mom, stays with her Friday overnight, Saturday, drives back home, goes back to work, you know? Whereas the unmarried brother pops in once in a while to say hi to, to dad. Loss of work and family time, traveling back and forth. I knew a lot of people in this congregation who had that experience, you know, aging parents, sick parents, they had to drive back and forth, and not just 100 miles, sometimes two, 300 miles. Um, a discussion whether to bring dad home with one of the children or that dad is going to go live in the nursing home with mom. There's a change. The broken routine of regular worship because of this new change, this new development. Conflict over financial responsibility for the care and the expenses. You know, the daughter's driving back and forth, maybe staying over, spending money to do this, but the brother is perhaps not thinking, well, maybe I ought to split gas with her, maybe I ought to help her out with the expenses. One of the big problems that I've seen is um, uh, one of the children hardly lifts a finger to help the parents. And then when there's a death, then that person who hardly lifted a finger to help the parents, all of a sudden they want a say in everything, they want to make sure that they get their share of the inheritance. You know what I mean? It's just trouble. Another scenario. <clears throat> you've just moved to a new city with your family. 
You're happy for a new job, new opportunity, maybe a little more money. Your wife, of course, she misses her parents and your children are having trouble in their new school. The church you now go to has less people in programs than your old church. What'll be some of the issues here? Well, perhaps more arguments between husband and wife. Stress for failure of the children in school. Children used to be doing a whole lot better back in the old school, you know, back where we used to live. Now they're, they're maybe not adapting as quickly. Maybe they're having problems. Grades are not as good. And of course, loss of intimacy because of the pressure and the anxiety of a change. And after all, what is it? You just move from A to B, and yet that change, moving from A to B, created all kinds of problems that you have to deal with. So I've just given you know, two very common types of experiences to show that changes bring new situations to get used to and then new problems to solve. And the point I'm making, and I think the reason why some people put this down, so many people put this down, is that not everybody is able to cope with change. Some people, you know, they manage it. Uh, my wife and I sat down once and tried to count how many times we have moved since we've been married. 23 times. <laughs> 23 times in 30 uh, in 38 uh, uh, years of marriage. That's a lot of moving. And I don't mean just moving next door, I mean moving from a city to another city, to another church, to another work, to mission work, to back to another mission work, back and forth, back and forth. Thankfully, my wife copes well with these kinds of changes brings the best out in her. She, it's a challenge. All right, we're going to get organized, we're going to do this, and you know, it doesn't take her a long time to kind of whip a new place into shape, and it feels like home and in a hurry. Now, the upside of a thing like that is our children are very close because they're, they're used to being, you know, they were their own friends because they were always the new kids in school, this school and that school, so they began to rely on one another. The downside? The downside is they were having trouble figuring out where their roots were <laughs> when you move that many times. And of course, I make an aside, this congregation is about as close to home as they have ever had. That's why they're so drawn to and so happy to be back in, in, uh, in Choctaw. So all of these changes that I mentioned, they bring stress and anxiety, depression, even physical illness or family breakdown. So whether it's a new school, or maybe going back to school as an adult, uh, declining health, your declining health or the declining health of a family member, or moving, as I mentioned, or a first marriage. It's supposed to be a happy thing, a first marriage, but you know, that brings a lot of stress as well. Or maybe a subsequent marriage. You've been married before and divorced or widowed or whatever, and now you're remarrying. Well, that has all of its own baggage right there. Stuff that you've got to deal with. A new baby, or a job, or retirement from a job, or a failure of some kind, or perhaps adapting to a greater responsibility. All of these changes. So changes you know, are difficult, and learning to cope with change is a large part of our maturing process, because the older you get, the more changes there are many times. Change in health, change in circumstances, kids moving out, kids getting married, kids moving back in. <laughs> Those things cause stress. Now, changes in every area of our lives are inevitable. You have to get used to the idea that there will always be changes. We, we can't avoid, uh, uh, avoid the fact that our lives will encounter change from time to time, sometimes for good, sometimes not so good. So the first thing we need to understand and accept is that there will be change. You just have to accept that. There will be change. No need to be surprised or upset when it finally occurs. If we accept that change is a natural, if not always easy, but a natural part of life, 
we can more easily learn the things that we need to do to cope with changes. And actually, what is this class about, right? It's about you know, sins and struggles, how to deal with sin, well, how to deal with struggles. And that's uh, our first opportunity to do that is tonight. Because this is the first struggle that has kind of surfaced in our, in our survey. So uh, obviously, the lesson tonight, is, you know, we're not going to exhaust all of the more positive ways to deal and cope successfully with change. We only have 30 minutes or so. But hopefully what I'm going to share with you is going to help you see what God provides us with in order to support us in changing times in our lives. All right, so dealing with change, struggling with change, some things to keep in mind. Number one, keep change in perspective. You know, there's an ebb and flow to life that bring natural changes with them. Try to keep this in mind. Solomon said that there was a time, you know, a time for everything under the sun, and all the things he mentions in Ecclesiastes 3 have to do with change, right? That's what he's talking about. There's a time for everything under the sun, right? Time to be born, time to die, time to start, time to stop, time for war, time for peace, searching, giving up searching, building, tearing down, all of these things that he mentions are changes. And the point he makes is there's a time for change. All of us go through them. And if we remember, there is a time. In other words, there's a beginning of the time when changes come, but there's also an end. We eventually you know, end up coping with it. We eventually end up dealing with it, understanding it. So the coping problem that change engenders is one of dealing with how we feel about the different set of circumstances that face us because of the change. And what happens, you know, people who wrote down, boy, this is a big problem for me, you know, coping with change, is that we get nervous and sometimes depressed because we begin to think that the change is going to change everything, when in reality only a part of our lives will be different. You know, we overestimate the impact of the change. Oh no, this changes everything. Well, no. <laughs> this may just change this over here, but it doesn't change everything. So we need to keep change in, in perspective when it takes place. Sometimes we get nervous because the change is too fast. When the real problem is that we're too slow <laughs> accepting, the, accepting the change. Or the change is for the worst. We're always thinking something that looks kind of neutral, but some people tend to always go to the negative side first. Oh no, that, there we go. Boy, that spoils everything. No, we're all going to hell in a handbasket now, boy. And we say this because we're judging only the immediate results and not the long-term effects that may yield good results. How do you know? How do you know what's going to happen? How many times have people said, yourselves included, myself included, well, this thing started out and I never thought that this was going to be a good thing, but you know what? Looking back on it, boy, if this hadn't happened, then I wouldn't have met so-and-so or this wouldn't have happened. And you know, somehow God had worked it out. All things work for? Yeah, for good. And then of course, the one that really kind of you know, turns that screw, you know, <laughs> we have this screw you know, and situations turn that screw and make us tighter and tighter and more nervous and more stressed. You know? Well, the thing that really tightens it is we begin thinking that the change is not what we wanted. Of course, we think this when our will is crossed. But since when is our will the criteria for what is good or best? So just because it isn't what you wanted doesn't mean it's bad. It's just not what you wanted. <laughs> so change is less unsettling when we can see the big picture and not just the small universe of our own lives. For example, children marrying. Even marrying someone we're not crazy about. This may be traumatic for the moment, 
But you know what? In the long run, many children realize that they actually want to be at peace with mom and dad. And they want their parents' support as they begin raising their own families. You know, I remember when Lise and I were married. Um, she, of course, was French-Canadian. I was French too, but she was like pure French. Her mom was French, her dad was French, her grandparents were French, her great-grandparents were French, her great-great-great-great-great, all the way back to the boat, as they say. All the way back to the boat. An unbroken line of French Quebecois people. They were French when they arrived from France and they married and raised French families who married other French families, who married other French families, blah, 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 blah. And we get to Lise, and she brings home a guy whose name is Mazalongo. <laughs> <laughs> and to add insult to injury, not only, not only is he not French, but he speaks English. And then to make matters worse, He's not Roman Catholic. Are you kidding me? There were no great shouts of joy in her family. On top of that, he's broke. <laughs> he doesn't even have his own furniture. You know what I'm saying? This was not a happy moment for her parents and her family, although they were always, always very gracious and polite. But you know, you know what's happening. But with time, you know, they realized, well, these two young people, they really love each other and they're having babies and they're wanting to include us in their lives. So, okay, our daughter's name is Lise Mazalongo. <laughs> but she and her husband love us and want to include us in their family, and they bring the grandchildren to Joliet, to that, that's the little town they lived in. They bring the grandkids you know, as, uh, very often to, to, share, you know, to share time with grandma and grandpa. And okay, he's not Roman, you know, he's not Catholic. I used to be, you know, but I'm not Catholic anymore. I wasn't a minister when, I, when Lise and I got married. These are like Bible people, and we don't, we don't get that. But you know what? They're walking the walk. They're living according to what they believe. They're sincere in their faith. So I guess, you know. So at first blush, it was like, oh no, you know, uh, our youngest daughter has blown herself up. But they gave it a little bit of time and they realized, okay, it's not so bad. And I have to share with you my mother-in-law that I love dearly. What a wonderful, wonderful woman she was. So gracious, so kind, so wise. And she had leukemia. Um, this is the thing that took her away. And um, uh, at the end, I went to see her. She was quite lucid, uh, not a week before she died. And I went in to see her alone, and we talked and visited. And you know, I told her, you know, her name was Elin, and I said, you know, I love you, Elin. You know, I always have, and I've always respected you. And she says, well, don't tell the others, but you're my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we all got that speech, you know, <laughs> but it was good. So what's the point? The point is, you know, sometimes you think the whole thing has gone down, but you know, give it some time. Give it some time. Sometimes the changes, you know, some good comes out of those things. Um, another example right here in Choctaw, I'm looking around here and pretty much everybody in this room, you know, was when we did the renovation, remember? I mean, that was a difficult time for some of the members when we did this thing. I mean, just the cost alone, half a million dollars, wow, for this little church here. Some people expressed their thoughts quite clearly. Well, there's nothing wrong with the old building. Why do we need to change it? Why do we need to expand it? Some worried about the debt. How are we ever going to pay that off? And many, they didn't like the inconvenience, the dirt and the dust and sitting in folding chairs and you know, having to shut down the kitchen. And, I mean, 18 months you know, of, of disturbance. 
of change. But we survived and we grew and the debt is almost paid off. And looking back, could you imagine if we had not done the expansion, where would we put all the people that we have? So keeping change in perspective, or rather in the perspective, that changes in life are constant and that most changes, they do work out in the long run. Keeping this perspective helps lower the panic and the fear level that comes along with the many changes that we face in life. Try to keep stuff in perspective. Another way to cope with change more successfully is to entrust God with the changes. You know, one of the questions that most epitomizes how we feel about change is the following. How will I ever be able to deal with you know, this change? My daughter got a divorce. You know, my sister has cancer and whatever. How am I ever going to deal with this? All this talk about the difficulty of dealing or coping with change usually is a sign of fear. We're afraid that we won't be able to adjust. We're afraid that people will be left behind. Everybody's moving this way and we're going to be left behind. Uh, we're, afraid that, um, we're afraid of the pain and that the pain will be too great. We won't be able to deal with the pain. How many people have been caretakers of an individual that they love, the family member, and dealt with that individual for many, many months or years? And, and the thought is, what am I going to do? How am I ever going to deal when this person dies? And the more they think about it, the more this, oh man, I don't think I could, you know, what am I going to do? And then it happens. And then somehow a day goes by and another day goes by and another week goes by, and another week goes by, and pretty soon you hear something on the radio that makes you laugh, and you surprise yourself, I just laughed, <laughs> I just smiled, I just found something that was kind of funny. And you smell food that you like, you know, life kind of keeps on going. And you say to yourself, what was I so afraid? Why was I so afraid? Sometimes uh, we fear that we are not going to like the change, uh, the things that change brings us. New job, new house, whatever. People buy a house, they design the house and everything, then they have all this anxiety. I sure hope I like the new house as much as I love the old house. Now I'm not saying that these are not legitimate feelings and concerns. You know, let's face it, a woman has surgery for breast cancer and her concern for the changes that will result from this that's a very real fear. Or a 47-year-old man loses his job with the company that he's worked for for 25 years and this is going to bring serious change into his life. Yeah, you can't just blow that off, oh, nothing. A couple decides to sell their home and move to a retirement community. Yeah, that's going to, whoa. A young person chooses to go to college far away from home. A young couple decide, let's, let's begin our family. You know, we've, we've been married a year or two, we've taken a trip here and that, but is it the right time? Shall we start a, a family? Boy, it's going to mean a lot of things we're not going to be able to do, or not going to have as much money. Am I going to stay home with the baby, or am I going to go back to, you know, all these things. These are legitimate concerns, so I'm not kind of, whitewashing those and I'm not saying, ah, oh, don't worry about it, sure. So these are real life scenarios that will cause upheaval and uncertainty in anyone who experiences these kinds of changes. Of course there will be fear, of course there'll be anxiety and stress, but what I'm saying is that this doesn't only have to be fear. In other words, the feelings that we have don't necessarily have to only be fear or anxiety or stress. For the Christian, there's the avenue of prayer that brings us into the presence and the protection of Almighty God. In Hebrews 13, <coughs> excuse me, the writer expresses 
his utmost trust in God in the face of all circumstances when he writes the following. He says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. And I will pause there. Not only content with what you have, but content with what changes bring you. Okay? Because a lot of times we fear that the change is going to bring us to a point where we're not happy or we're not content with the new thing. Then the writer continues, he says, being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man, or changes, do to me? Now, what is it about the term uh, uh, I will never desert you? What, what is it about that we don't understand? <laughs> Can we twist that to make it mean sometimes I'll desert you? <laughs> no, he said I will never desert you. I will never forsake you. Never, he says, ever. It'll never happen. We need to kind of you know, keep this in mind. Of course, change is threatening and frightening and difficult, but it's not impossible, nor does it have to be the cause for a negative experience. God assures us that He will always be with us to watch over us and to provide for us. And it's easy to believe this while times are stable and times are predictable and your job is there and you know, you're making money and you've got plenty, you've got more overtime than you can manage and that, that's fine. But what do you think is happening to those guys that worked in the 55 story or whatever it is, Devon Tower, thinking we're on top of the world, are you kidding me? We just built this billion dollar high rise and, you know, what does it represent? Strength in the economy, money, power, and the people who are working at the Devon Tower, are you kidding me? They're thinking, we're on top of the world, we're the boss. Look at me, I got an office up on the 45th floor. And yesterday they laid off a thousand people because <laughs> the price of oil went from $176 a barrel to $28 a barrel. That in itself, that one example in itself should teach us once and for all that our faith and our dependence should always be on God, not on man, not on the strength of our finances, not on the strength of our government, our military, not on the strength of our company. Our dependence is always on God and He will always find a way to provide for us. It's a promise that he makes. So it's when we find ourselves in the eye of the storm that this promise is difficult to believe. But think of it, is anything too difficult for God? Do changes confuse God or make it any more difficult for Him to care for us? On the contrary, I have found that it is in the process of change and upheaval that my relationship with God grows stronger and more intimate and more spiritually satisfying. Why? Because I'm actually seeing Him at work. When I'm surrounded by the Devon Tower and $176 a barrel oil, I'm having trouble seeing God at work. But when I'm on the edge, when I have to totally depend on Him from day to day, then I see him work. Perhaps this is because while everything around us seems to constantly be changing, I then see more clearly the unchanging nature of God's love and care. And for me, this remains a solid foundation upon which to build my hope. I mean, if the same God who said, let there be light, and there was light. <laughs> Surely he can provide for myself and Lee's, you know, the small expense that we have to maintain our life. Surely he can do that. 
So different people, let me just summarize a little bit here, different people react to change in different ways. Ask yourself, you know, test yourself, which is your go-to method when there's change, traumatic change. Some uh, react with resignation. They simply resign themselves to it. This is a kind of a passive aggressive approach to change. They don't resist it, but they don't accept it either. The change doesn't change them, it merely changes their circumstances. So some people just, you know, go with the flow, I'm a reed in the wind. Other people, their go-to reaction is resistance. Some people fight change, any kind of change, any kind of change. And this is how they cope with it, they resist it. <laughs> That, you know, if change comes, I just lock, I pull the handbrake. <laughs> Automatic reaction. I just pull the, I haven't even heard what the change is, but the moment I feel, uh-oh, whoever this person is or whatever is happening is going to mean some kind of change for me. I stop everything, because that's how I cope with change. Sometimes we do have to resist change because perhaps the change is a bad change. You know what I'm saying? It'll lead us into sin or you know, whatever. But some people resist change because they're against any kind of change. It's their coping mechanism. If I can maintain everything the way it is without change, I feel safe. So they resist any kind of change. And what happens is, this becomes a character trait rather than a management tool. See the difference? To resist as a management tool means you're observing the change and you're saying, well, there's some things I, I, I'm not sure about. I need more information. So that's good. Put the brakes down. Slow down. Take a look. That's, that's using resistance as a management tool. But some people resist not as a management tool, as a character you know, as a character trait. And when it's a character trait, the problem is you cannot discern what's going on. Because your effort to resist blinds you to the possibilities of what's supposed to be, what could be a good change. Other people, um, uh, for them, repetition is their way. They promote change, the exact opposite. Those people love change because change is the antidote to their boredom and their lack of sense of self. These are folks who make change happen because they like change, any kind of change, so long as it changes. Again, that's, that's not a coping mechanism. You know, that's not a tool. We can use change as a tool to motivate, to change, to improve. But when it becomes a character trait, I change stuff just because I'm bored, then that can be dangerous. Hopefully, I, I, I've, I've described to you a more healthy and biblical approach to dealing with change uh, in our lives. Review, one, accept the fact that change in life is natural and inevitable. Don't be surprised or hurt or panicked because change is normal. And at every stage of our life, not just when we're very young, but it, it goes through all of our life, change happens to us. Secondly, try to keep the changes in your life in proper perspective. Don't overreact or overestimate the impact of changes that you face. And don't try to predict the future. <laughs> oh, I know what's going to happen now. And thirdly, put your trust in God. God is aware of every change in circumstance in our life and we just need to trust Him with the outcome of the changes in our lives. Whatever we need, He's going to provide. Whatever we lose, He will restore in His own way. Sometimes we don't get back the thing that's been changed or that we've lost. 
we get something else. And it's not the same. And it may not be better or worse, just different. Just different. Of course, there's only one final change that all of us should look forward to as Christians, and that is the change that we will undergo when Jesus returns. Our mortal bodies will be transformed. Well, what's another word for transformed? Changed into glorious ones in order to dwell in heaven with God forever. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. And so <laughs> we better get ready for change because there's one humongous change coming at the end of our lives. We will be conscious of who we are, but we will have a different body, a different casing, because we will exist in a different dimension. Can a fish live you know, on land? Well, no. Can a cat survive underwater? Well, no, why? These are different dimensions. They're not designed. A fish is not designed to live on land and a cat has not been designed to live in the water. These mortal bodies have not been designed to exist in the, spirit, in the purely spiritual dimension. We need another kind of body to exist in the spiritual dimension. And what Paul is saying here is at the end of our lives, in the twinkling of an eye, we will let go this physical body and we will have, do we know what it looks like? No. All we know is that it'll be different than this one. Why? Because it will have to exist in a different dimension with different parameters. The only thing we do know is that God will be there and Christ will be there and the angels will be there and we will be there and that we will know who we are and we will know who He is. We know that much. We know that much. I suspect that a lot of the changes that take place in our lives helps prepare us for the great change that will, take at the, that will happen at the end of our lives. So try to keep that in mind. So let's cope with change, with faith, with trust, and with hope that we will be found worthy to be changed into the glory of God when the proper time comes. All right, so that's our lesson number five, issue number five here, um, coping with change. I said that there was another issue that was tied with that one, and I will, uh, I will discuss that next week. All right, thank you for your attention.